Welcome back, Zerka fans, to the January 2v2 tournament. We have round three starting up. It's going to be on Gecko Isle, a map I've actually never had a chance to play on. But we have Pokedrill and Mordor versus Saniac and Topcac. Just waiting on them to clean up the last little bits of their game. But we have seen that Pokedrill and Mordor have had a bit of a hard time in this tournament so far. Up against Monero and Trepak, as well as against, well, 400 and Google Frog, so good luck with that. So they haven't had the kindest of bracket lineups thus far, and this one is probably going to be no different. They're against Saniac and Topcac, which, that's going to be tricky. We did see Saniac and Topcac before, and, well, they've been doing pretty okay. They're 1-1 one one so far, beat Glatch, Hushing, Shatria, lost to 400 and Google Frog, but of course, that doesn't so much matter. What matters is whether or not they're able to do well in this round, because this round is going to be the round that decides it for, well, Gets another point, which doesn't decide for anything, but it's just... For Mojo and Pokedrill, this is the round that matters for them. So the question is, how is that going to work? And right now, Mojo and Pokedrill, starting out with... Looks like a... Well, it's hard to say what they're starting out with yet. Mojo and Pokedrill just starting out in the plateau. So this map! This map is full of plateaus and also reefs. So I guess it's not very good for ships. Although, admittedly, ships grounding themselves is not a thing in this game. But yeah, overall, it's a pretty interestingly built map. A lot of plateaus, a lot of flat ground. It's mostly, it's mostly a lot like desert plateaus, actually. Like, largely flat, some obstacles in the way. That's kind of a, a common way that Zerke maps tend to be built. But, we'll see how that build plays out. At this point, we're seeing Mordor going immediately for rovers. Cloakie's coming out of Pokedrill. We actually haven't seen any vehicles thus far, just because the maps really haven't been built for it. I mean, neither of the maps we've seen thus far, neither Contested Canyon nor Lonely Oasis, actually really support vehicles very well. Just the way the pathfinding works, and I don't know if this one's gonna either. Granted, most of the map is flat, so it probably will be fine. And we indeed have Hovercraft coming out from Saniac as well. So Topcac on the Cloakie, Mord Mordor on the Rovers, and Pokedrill also on Cloakie, because, hey, that's what you do. So right off the bat, looks like Pokedrill is going again for fairly aggressive, as, well, people generally do. While at the same time, Mordor going for Mason right off the bat. They want quite a bit of two Masons off the bat. They want their economy. They're figuring this map is big. I can work with that. They only have the one dart to scout out to see what's going on. But otherwise, not going to worry about it. At the same time, we see this similar thing happening to Topcac. Starting out with Conjurer, getting some reclaim as well. Because, hey, 225 reclaim. Good stuff. Get that off the bat. Get a very nice beginning, opening. And that appears to be really only what the north side is doing. The south side, we don't see that at all. So the north side getting an extra 5 metal per second off that right off the bat, which is great for them. At the same time, though, it's not like Pokedrill is just going to let them completely bowl them over. But with these 5 daggers coming in from Saniac, that could happen regardless. These 5 daggers not going to be quite enough to one-shot most things, but it is still going to be enough to one-shot Glaives, no problem. And that's pretty much the only defense available. Everything else is Masons, and the Masons would not be one-shot. They'd be two-shot. But even then... What can you do? The Scorchers. The Scorchers are going to be one-shot with this many daggers. It's just a matter of how many daggers are able to get in and actually deal the damage they need to. And the answer is enough! The Lotus has been built up. It might be able to get rid of the Mason. Oh, that is tricky. If they could get rid of the Mason, that would be a huge blow. But at this point, it is at least forcing Mordor to build up defenses. And they're building up very concentrated defenses right now. While at the same time, over to the north side, we're seeing some expansions. Actually, not very, many, not very many defenses. Pretty much all expansions. Just reclaim and expansions. The reclaim being the first priority because, hey, why not? You just need power. You get the reclaim. You're good. At the same time, though, Pokedrill coming in here, potentially getting rid of a Conjurer from Topcac, and indeed they are! So Topcac losing a Conjurer, losing some of their expansion potential, and that actually is leaving South with a bit of an economic advantage. North does still have the reclaim, and that is their main claim to economy right now. But... If solid economy coming in from south side can be built up and be defended well enough, this could actually be a relatively even game. That being said, though, with the amount of reclaim coming in from the north side, the amount of workers coming in to do the reclaim, it seems likely that the north side is still going to be able to maintain a strong economic advantage, despite the fact that they don't have as much of a solid economy just because of the sheer number of rocks. Like Within their side of the map, with all the stuff they've reclaimed, there's 2,500 metal they can easily grab. So, for reference, they could have like, 25 metal per second for a minute and a half. Or plus 25, they could have, well not 25, but like 50 metal per second for about two minutes. 
and use that to build up solid economy if they'd like, and then just maintain that economic position. Whereas the South Side, they're building up their solid economy, which is good, but it's a question of, can they build it fast enough? And the answer apparently is no, since we do see right now Mordor leaving one of those masons to idle rather than continuing to build up the metal extractors. Also, I should point out, just because it's a little curious, most of this area is actually impassable to vehicles, which does mean they're not going to have to worry so much about Saniac. If they start building up over here, they will have to worry about whatever comes out of Topcac. Or actually, yeah, they will. It's, it is passable by bots, not by vehicles, which is what I expected. So at the very least, that does reduce the amount of enemies that could attack them. For now. That is assuming, of course, Top Cac and Saniac don't just change factories, which they likely will. I mean, they were discussing going for gunships as well. So Top Cac likely to throw that in there at some point once they get a decent economy built up. And at this point, they are getting their solid economy built up on top of the reclaim they've already gotten. This is exactly what you do to make sure that you have a strong economy base going forward. But at the same time, harassment is coming in from all of the South team. Not managing to get a whole lot of mileage out of it, but at least managing to break a little bit of the possible offensive that would have come in. Sanex Lightning Gun Commander, however, is doing exactly the job it needs to do, and that's the job that leaves them alive. So really, the Scorchers are not going to do the trick against that, against the Lightning Gun Commander. Man, that's, that's tough, because you just don't want to get things stunned, but I would almost recommend just racketeering it into Disarm and then hitting it with whatever. It doesn't matter what you use, just Disarm it first. Of course, at this point, the question is, what are we going to see coming out from this assault here? Because at this point, Topcac, they have a strong assault coming into the south side here. Should be able to get rid of Pokedrill's base, no problem. But the question, of course, is, are they going to go for it? And the answer is no. It is a fairly large assault, but it looks like Topcac just figures, I just need pressure. They just figure they need pressure. They don't need to push hard. They don't need to deal much damage. They just need to keep Topcac, I'm sorry, they just need to keep Pokedrill in their base, and Topcac maintains the position. They keep their units alive. At the same time, though, that might actually be very relevant as the Scorchers coming into the base. They have an easy shot at getting rid of these Conjurers. And there's nothing else supporting that factory, so all the economy coming in here... I mean, we're enough for the Ronin coming in, and even with them... Oh, that is that is a nice slowdown coming in from the south side. It's a mild production slowdown, and I really wish for their sake they'd gone and tried to hunt after the Conjurers. That would have been a more productive option than just going for the factory. But hey, they slowed down production. It's now just 10 metal per second for this entire time. So North starting to access metal a little bit, and there's no caretakers up. Saniac does have the caretakers and a pretty solid defense on the caretakers, but not so for Topcat. So I could see potentially Mordor coming in trying to assault Topcat cross map and getting a lot of a lot of value for that. However, that may not happen as Topcat did manage to get rid of pretty much entirely Mordor's army. But the scorches up front on a suicide mission, the ones in the back on defense, well, they didn't do their job right. And at this point, there's nothing that their teammate Pokedrill can do to save them. So, other than this one Stardust, which saves the day thanks to the yard map of this factory, the only reason it's able to shoot in is because the factory doesn't block much shots. The Glaives are stopped. But, that's the thing, though, is that Topcac, the big loss there was in production. And at this point, they're getting some support as well from their teammates, so... Overall, this is not going to be a massive blow. It's a slight roadblock, a small speed bump. I liked the idea, but I don't see it managing to maintain itself, especially as Mordor's commander is about to go down. And with that, Mordor will lose even more economy. The south side already behind an economy and already accessing. Do they even have caretakers? No! They have no factory assistance whatsoever. No, sorry, Focadrill does have a caretaker, but we don't see any caretakers coming out from Mordor. I mean, as much as I like Mordor's tactics, and I like the way that they're approaching this match, they don't have the economy to maintain that. It's it's over unless they can massively build up or reclaim everything right away, and that is going to be tricky considering the amount of forces their opponents have. Just, like, the scalpels alone are going to pretty much stop any masons coming around the map, on top of the fact that now the ravens can come in and just deal whatever damage they like. I mean, they're going to tear apart the factory. How often do you see ravens come in and tear apart a factory? Not often. But at this point, they might as well because nothing's going to stop them. So with that, there's not a whole lot that the South Side has available to deal with this, and I could see them throwing in the towel right away if they push and don't succeed. They have... Pokedrill does have a push setting up. Not so much for Mordor. Mordor, even without the loss of the factory, wasn't building a whole lot. So really, Mordor is more the economic base, while Pokedrill is the production base. But of course, the question is, can this push work? And the answer is likely going to be no, but we are going to see... As it moves forward, 
I mean, Glaives up front in front of Ronin. I do like the fact that they that Poke Patrol is maintaining speed between them, so the Glaives don't get too far ahead of their support the support troops. But at the same time, they are getting a little bit in single file just by the nature of where their target locations are. And that could lead to problems. I mean, right now, this is actually where Glaives would want to run forward and get rid of those without being held back by the rest of their squad. They just rush forward, get rid of the Ronin. Nothing else is there as any kind of assault force that's going to stop them. Granted, there's no way right now that Poke Patrol can know that they don't have radar available. They have no scouting. Certainly don't have these owls here. So what can they do? I guess guess. That's really about all they can do. At this point, though, the fact that the Glaives were near the rest of their forces does mean the entire army does arrive all at once, which is good for the Thunderbird, probably more so than it is good for Pokedrill. As Pokedrill does have that Reaver up, it is going to be able to get rid of quite a few of the Glaives and stop the follow-up assault from Top Gag. So that's why you want to keep your army together. Like I said, I really like the way Pokedrill played that. It's just they did have the opportunity on the Ronin that I saw, that which they couldn't have seen. But I do like the fact that they didn't get, get their forces too separated. The problem, of course, is that they didn't have enough forces. It was a good idea. It was reasonably well executed. It didn't have the macro behind it. It didn't have the economy behind it. And another push is being attempted again. But at this point, Pokedrill's first push is completely getting stuffed. Did manage to get a few damages here and there. A few buildings taken out. Maybe a power plant or two. Definitely a couple metal extractors. But otherwise, not much. And with the, econ with the economic difference between the two teams, it's not saying much. North side has a two-fold economic advantage over the south side, so those lost pushes are just more nails in the coffin for the south team. I I mean, I'm glad we are seeing the south team put in the spirit. They have, they have the effort. They have the right idea. They just didn't have the economy off the bat. Whereas we saw the north side reclaim their entire area, or almost their entire area, before building solid economy. That's what you get for that. You get a massive economic base, which translates into a massive solid economic base, which translates into a strong military. While at the same time, Pokedrill and Mortar are trying kind of to go for this highly defensive one base play, which would actually work really well for if they were building up a reclaim base. The amount of power they have, if it weren't for the fact that it's in wind generators in a map that doesn't have great wind, it would work really well. If it was solar plants, and there are a lot of solar plants, the amount of power they have a little bit more, maybe throw in a couple Geos, they'd have a great base for Reclaim. But unfortunately, it's far too late for that. Still, though, that is a thing to bear in mind. This is a map with a lot of Reclaim, that's a thing to always look for. If you have a map that you see a lot of rocks on the map, just grab a Constructor, hit the Reclaim button, so right here, and draw a nice circle. And there you go. That'll give you loads of cash right off the bat. Turn that into Metal Extractor, turn that into Army to help support the Metal Extractor construction. And we saw North Team smoothly transition from Reclaim and Metal Extractors. Like, that was masterfully done. The way they did it, just follow that. If you're on a map with a lot of Reclaim. If you're on a map with not a lot of Reclaim, obviously you do the standard thing at as Pokedrill and, and Mordor were doing. But normally, no. Normally you want to just keep it as it is. And we see already, like, North Side just... Metal produced was way higher. Metal used, it was a two-fold lead. They had an economic lead from the start, thanks to all the reclaim. And like 4,000 metal reclaimed. When you consider the amount used, that's actually not a huge amount used, come to think of it. Like, they produced a lot more than that, just considering what they had. But yeah, metal reclaimed helped a lot. It helped keep their metal income high, especially during the beginning part of the game. And there was hardly any response from the South team. Anyway, that was that, and that was actually a more even match than I expected it to be. So, you know, well done to Pokedrill and Mordor for putting the fight in. Anyway, back to the bracket. We don't have a whole lot of change updated so far. I mean, it's quite possible that something has changed, but nothing's updated the lobby yet, or nothing updated the bracket yet. So, presumably, other matches are still going on. And indeed, there are a few. It looks like at this point... The Cortis Killer Lynx versus Google Frog match is the least advanced match of all the matches. So let's let's check that out. See what happens. I'm actually kind of curious how they've handled it because, well, this is this is a situation where you have a lot going on. And Pokedrill in chat throwing in the towel because at this point Pokedrill is the only one who actually has a towel available except me. So starting out, we have 
again, similar start out, where the plateaus are the main focus. And again, we have a similar... Actually, we don't have a lot of reclaim coming from either side. No one's really going for the reclaim right off the bat. South team going a little bit more. That's Google Frog and 400, trying to take as much reclaim as they can. The north side, again, not going for as much, but they already got the economic base from the bat from the start, and they also didn't have to worry as much about getting the reclaim disadvantage right off the bat either. So with the forces lost by the south side, it's actually fairly even right from the beginning. And it looks like overall, with the economic parity, that does lead to a lot of damage coming in for the north side. As the north side's able to convert both the reclaim and the solid economy into a bit of an advantage, or at least a bit of a push. Maintaining center control, that's the main thing. They have center and they have this plateau. They'll be in reasonably good position. And they do get that plateau, but at the cost of quite a few of their units. Not so many of the bandits have confidence to get in quite yet. They certainly shouldn't. The Reavers are up and the Reavers will stop them as the bandits do overextend. And that actually leaves the commander dead for 400. So at this point, 400 is going to be losing that. They're going to be losing a lot more than that if if things continue as they are. But the trades are coming in. 400 managing to get the Zeus's in. And Google Frog with the thugs to at least deal a bit more damage. But as it stands, the south side is having a difficult time maintaining the position they have. The north side, they have an economic advantage by almost a factor of two. So again, Reclaim coming in and taking... Actually, not good at Reclaim in this case. It was early Reclaim that saved it for the last match. And they say can Top Cat have such an advantage. But in this match, it's not. It was later Reclaim coming in from Google Frog 400, which did them some good. But it's not quite enough to maintain what they need. So at this point, Google Frog 400 on the back foot a little bit. They're losing some of their expansions over to the southwest side. They haven't managed to get a whole lot of rating in the northeast. Links with the fusion plan as well. So whatever reclaim that the north side tries to go for, they've got it. Like, no problem. If you look at the amount of reclaim available, yeah, they have almost all of the starting reclaim. As opposed to with the south side, where they have taken a few hundred of theirs, and they are continuously taking reclaim. Like, the south side much more focused on the reclaim. But again, it's really a question of how much of that reclaim is going to be valid. Like, how much of the reclaim is going to be taken and turn into money, turn into metal, turn into... Well, it's all metal. I mean, turn into units. Turn into a proper military. Of course, the bigger question is, what is the South team going to do to make up for the loss of solid military? I like the title plants. So that's a good idea. Set those up. Get that going for something. But at the same time, it's just... Maintaining that against the sheer pressure coming in, and particularly from Lynx... With a cloaky factory coming in there, that's just huge. At the same time, though, we do have a bit of counter pressure coming up from the south side, but I don't see it being enough. Cortez the Killer has boatloads of forces on the ground. Google Frog has some, but it's not enough. Like, they have what? Four Scorchers and a Leveler? Or Ripper, rather? They haven't got much. This, this fight, if it goes in favor of the south side, would turn things around at least a little bit. Would allow for an opening with the south side to rebuild, but it's a question of can it do so? Really, it's gonna come down to the it's gonna come down to the defensors. If the fences go down, that is huge. And the fences might actually go down. They were hit hard before they managed to even get solidly deployed. Which does mean not a whole lot of damage is dealt, which means the fencers are going down for free, but the question, of course, then becomes the rippers. And with the Ronin up, the rippers could go down with the Reavers in back, perfectly positioned to deal with the Glaze. That is ideal. The Reavers and, Scor or the Reavers and Scorchers stopping the Glaze from doing any major damage to the Ronin as the Ronin are able to take care of the Rippers, and the Rippers go down with no value for Cortez the Killer or Lynx, and loads of damage, loads of reclaim right next to Google Frog's base. This could turn things around. If Google Frog takes this reclaim, turns it into an army, they have the caretakers for it, they and their teammate have the caretakers for it. They just need to get that metal and make that work. Because at this point, Google Frog... Google Frog and Lynx are making that attrition advantage. Well, they're getting an attrition advantage. Not just they had a disadvantage before. It's it's getting a parity. If they can turn that into economy, and they are starting to reclaim, so indeed they are. This could turn around right away. Like that first fencer push there, just the separation between the fencers and the rippers, that led to Cortez the Killer losing their entire army, and with that, a massive potential swing for the south side. It's just a matter of economy. They need to build that up because even losing that isn't huge. North side still has a two-fold metal advantage, even though the attrition did start to even out for the south side. It's fallen apart again. South side has some reclaim, but it is still contested. The question is, can they get some masons in? And indeed, Google Frog's going for it. I mean, you might as well. You're this behind economically. You have to. There is no way around it. Reclaim is absolutely necessary. The one thing, though, there's a lot of reclaim that's untaken and uncontested. So I'm not sure what we're going to see off this, other than additional pushes coming in down from Cortez the Killer. It's 
it is still a strong push from the north side. And despite that first small victory, the south side does not have the economy to maintain army production to be able to actually push against this repeated assault. And I appreciate the mission going for it, at least getting some out, some reclaim out of it. But again, there's a lot of free reclaim. There's a lot of reclaim in the back. A lot of forces that came around the back and harassed, and which are continuing to come around the back and continue to harass. And 400 did not have the defenses to stop those glaives, so those glaives are having a field day. While at the same time, the frontal assault managing to break through, get very close to Google Frog's base, and even with the Stardust here, defensers should be able to deal with it. That should not be a problem, and I don't see 400 and Google Frog managing to maintain any pressure against this. They are pretty well dead, unless a miracle happens. And hey, it's a wall. That's a good start. It's not perfect. Does still leave an opening, but it leaves fewer positions from which the fencers can actually attack the base. Still, though, the real problem, of course, is the Ravager and the Ripper. And the Ravager-Ripper combo will be able to at least stop the next Ravagers coming in. It's going to lock down the factory, possibly destroy it. And it, actually, yes, it will destroy it with the fencers managing to circle around, get the position they need, make that wall irrelevant, take out the factory. And I think with that, we will see Google Frog and 400 throw in the towel. One last push from 400, though. One last push. Maybe that'll be the way they get back in. But with a twofold economic advantage, it is hard to believe that's going to be it. Especially with the raiding, we are at least getting some reclaim off the, the forces that have been destroyed. But it's hard to really say what's going to be pushed. I mean, it looks like at the same time, there was some harassment going in from 400 over to the north side. And not a whole lot of pressure being applied again. Like, these forces are being built, but it looks like, for the most part, the north side has taken advantage of their current military lead. Turning it into an economic lead with energy. They're focusing much more on building fusion plants than they are on building anything else. And that leaves the south side with a decent position to work from. I mean, they'll need to get more units produced because they are starting to excess quite heavily. But if they manage to rebuild a factory or build a new factory and get set up, they could turn that well, they could turn that massive amount of economy into a production advantage, turn them into a military advantage, and possibly turn this around. They are starting to get an attrition advantage. And with that, they could claw back, but they don't have the caretakers for it yet. They're just getting that now. And, of course, the factory being destroyed over here, that's a bit of a problem, mostly that the caretaker can't reach this factory over here, apparently. Or at least isn't. If it could reach the airplane plant, they'd be fine. They'd actually be in a really good spot right now. But it's not. Thankfully for them, though, they do have the Thunderbird at least slowing down the assault coming in from Lynx. But slowing down is the operative word. It's not stopping it. And with the north side continuing to build up, Cortez the Killer having gotten their fusion plant, they have nothing else to spend on except military, they might as well. Still, though, the south side getting some reclaim, which is good. It's just, again, it's the reclaim versus production. And at this point, the production again going to go down as Lynx just tears apart 400's base. And this is where I could see them throwing in the towel. They have one air plant between them. They have nothing else on the ground. The Thunderbird doing what it can, but it's not enough to save the factory in time. Well, there's a bit left for 400, but at this point, we're going to see... We're going to... 400 losing... Actually... All the commanders being lost as well, so no storage even for Southside. It's not even a question of excess. They can't store. They have nothing left. I mean, some storage might come up, but that's that's it. I I don't see other than a miracle. Like it would take an absolute miracle to get back in here, and it looks like that might be what's attempted using the air factory. There's enough reclaim that they could theoretically turn it around given enough time. But the question, of course, is time. How are they going to buy that? What do they have to enforce that their opponents don't destroy them in a second? Because, really, what do they have? They have some production coming in here. They have, what, 5 metal per second, maybe 15, if the caretaker manages to help out. Like, they have some stuff, but the caretaker is mostly focused on building planes. Which makes sense. They want to stop all these raptors coming in here, and the rippers coming in here. And the walls aren't doing a bad job of making that as difficult as possible. But ultimately, that airplane factory is going to go down. And with that going down, there's nothing left. There's nothing still building up this... This rover assembly, there's nothing really assisting the airplane factory. The Garretaker's not really doing much at all. It's trying to get some terraform in. That's all it can do is hem in these Ravagers and maybe get something. But there's not much. I mean, desperate rebuilding here, but it's a nearly tenfold economic advantage. And yeah, that's Google Frog's throwing in the towel. In fact, the entire south side's throwing the towel and north side takes that match. It seemed kind of close, but then again, Metal Income did decide the day. Metal Income and Attrition. At... There was a little while where South seemed to have a bit of an opportunity, but 
it just didn't have the production to make that work and didn't reclaim enough. I mean, I grant these are contested reclaim fields, but there was a period where Northside realized they had respect. They didn't need to push in hard. They just needed to rebuild, get a stronger economy to make a truly unbeatable push. And Southside, had they realized that, might have been able to reclaim a bunch, get like plus 30, plus 40 metal per second reclaim briefly, and build up enough of an army to push back the pressure and then claw back into the game. But that did not happen. So with that, we have, I believe, the entirety of round three, and indeed we do. Round three finishes with Cortez the Killer and Lynx being the only remaining undefeated teams. Actually, another, no, not undefeated. Sorry, they were actually defeated both times. My mistake. They've just managed to claw back in, so 400 Google Frog no longer undefeated. That's the more important thing here. So look at the way things are going. 400 and Google Frog currently at the top still, 2-1, but they're now tied with Saniac, Topcat, Kingshot, Power Stasis, and Black Touching, Kshatriya, and Anir and Katastria. Five-way tie for 2-1. As Cortez the Killer and Lynx manage to claw their way onto the board, getting 1-2. and two. And Manona and Trepak, they also got knocked out a little bit. So round four is going to be interesting, because round four we actually now have... We have a lot of matches between people who are on this tide. 400 Google Frog versus King's Dead Power Stasis. We have Black Touch and Chatra versus Manero. Actually, Manero and Chatra are 1 and 2. Sandy and Topcack against Cortez the Killer and Lynx. Again, 2 1 versus 1 2, but now I'm not sure how that's going to go. So at this point, I want to see. I'm, gonna, I'm curious about Black Touch and Chatra versus Manero and Chatra, how that's going to go. So, going to take a short break until we get to that, but. Until then, stay tuned. We will be back in a couple minutes. <laughs> 